So let me just begin by saying it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to discuss the philosophy of Elizabeth Anscombe. I've been an admirer of her work and of that of Peter Geach, her husband, whom I came to first, in fact. It was his work that I came to first, since being a student here in London many years ago. Like, many, like most people, the philosophical writings of hers that I first encountered were Modern Moral Philosophy, the essay, published in uh, the Royal Institute's Journal of Philosophy in 1958, Intention, which had been published in 1957, her Cambridge inaugural, Causality and Determination, which I think was probably 71, I think, probably around then, and then her, um, her essay uh, deriving from her lecture, The First Person, which is the mid-70s. Um, so really those four writings, Modern Moral Philosophy, Intention, Causality and Determination, and then The First Person. Unlike most others, however, who would have been familiar with those at that time, I also read uh, Contraception and Chastity, and transubstantiation in the pamphlet versions. Um, and it was evident from each of these that this was a writer of strong mind and strong opinion. Now, at that time, this is in the, in the 1970s, the initial interest in modern moral philosophy, that essay, and in Intention, her famous book, had waned, in fact. And if Anscombe's work was mentioned in discussions, it was more likely to be one of the other pieces um, in the case of causality and determination, if that were uh, referred to, it was generally to cite her conclusion, or an implication of it, that so far as the concept cause goes, there could be singular and non-necessitating causes. And secondly, her claims about causation being perceptible and indicated by active verbs, though one might add as much by passive ones. With regard to the first person, uh, that essay, the first person, the consensus was that while the argument might be subtle, the conclusion that I is not a referring expression is absurd. The initial responses to modern moral philosophy, I mean in the years immediately following its publication, the initial responses to modern moral philosophy were to the supposed bridging or closing of the Isot gap contested in response by Hare and company, and secondly, to the suggestion that ethics might be founded on facts about human nature, which was challenged by um, D.Z. Phillips and Howard Mounts. The latter being, as it were, as much a voicing of what, if I recall correctly, Anscombe termed the Swansea sigh. Uh, this was a sort of sound given out by Swansea Wittgensteinians. It was a sort of shudder, really, uh, in the face of what they regarded the crassness of anything that smacked of reduction. And the, the, uh, uh, Dewey Phillips and, and Howard Mounts, Howard's changed his view on this, but at that point, um, were of the view that Anscombe's invocation of human nature was <coughs> problematic. Now, the waning of interest thereafter, so that takes us up to really about the 1963 or 64. The waning of interest thereafter in that essay, Modern Moral Philosophy, was because the subject, moral philosophy itself, had gone heavily meta-ethical, and then, in part reaction to that, applied ethics had arisen. And her essay, I think, does not really fit into either category. As regards intention, it was neglected for two reasons. The first, the fact that it's so difficult a piece of work to follow and understand, that like Hawking's A Brief History of Time, even where it was owned, it was rarely read. More to the point philosophically, however, it was overtaken only six years after its publication by Donald Davidson's essay, Actions, Reasons and Causes. For Davidson's piece set the causalist ball rolling, or re-rolling, I think I should say, given that it had travelled quite far in the period before the publication of Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigations and the appearance thereafter of the Little Red Books, a series overseen by Roy Holland, which included um, Geach's Mental Acts and Anthony Kenny's Action, Emotion and Will, which incidentally, Kenny's Action, Emotion and Will, was the proximate cause of Davidson's paper. Because Davidson had, in fact, uh, 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 Davidson had been uh, invited or had taken the opportunity, perhaps offered it, uh, to review um, Action, Emotion and Will, and 
what was to have been that review then transformed itself into a more sustained criticism of what he saw as the Wittgensteinian um, view with regard to action, which was, was characteristic was a, of the family of authors who appeared in the series that Roy Holland edited, the Essays in Philosophical Psychology, um, in which, interestingly, Anscombe's book Intention could well have appeared, and I'm not altogether sure whether there was any discussion that it might do so. It's an interesting fact, but it would have been very much in keeping with the, the tenor of that series. Now, in the years since, <coughs> so I was talking about the waning of interest in modern moral philosophy after about 63, and then of intention, but in the years since, there's been something of a reversal of fortune for the four uh, Anscombe philosophical publications that I mentioned, the uh, Modern Moral Philosophy, Intention, Causality and Determination in the First Person. For little has been written on how to understand causality as she characterised it, and the fate of the first person has been a little like that of Malcolm's, Norman Malcolm's book on dreaming, to be dismissed as an effect of excessive Wittgensteinian zeal. Anyone who admires Anscombe as a philosopher would want to see her work read, and on that account should welcome the quite considerable attention given in the past 20 years or so to modern moral philosophy, great revival of interest in it, and indeed to intention. But I have reservations about some of this interest, particularly with regard to the former, with regard to modern moral philosophy. First, I think that some of it smacks of the culture of projects and programs, appropriating these writings for certain academic causes. The former, modern moral philosophy, as founding and endowing virtue ethics. The latter, intention, as serving as a locus for the debate about reasons and causes in the explanation of action. With regard to this, I'll only say in passing that I don't think that Anscombe was a virtue ethicist in the sense in which that expression is now widely used. And I also think that it's superficial to label her as anti-causalist, given that in her scheme, reasons often are causes, be it final and formal ones. And wherever there are these, there is also cooperative, efficient causation. I think Anscombe's view in this respect is rather more complex than people uh, uh, appreciate. <coughs> Though she doesn't exactly help the reader in this regard. And in part because of her general assule, not in total, but general assule of scholastic vocabulary, of which she was aware, but thought it prudent not to invoke it. Um, uh, second, however, and of relevance to the present context, is I think that this attention on modern moral philosophy and on intention has distracted from the effort that needs to be put in to understand, to learn from, and to carry further her work in other areas. I think simply that Anscombe has not been read widely enough across the range of her other work. Now, as my title, uh, Anscombe on Mind and World, suggests, I'll be discussing aspects of Anscombe's thought in the areas of philosophy of mind and metaphysics and philosophy of cognition. But I also wish to say things along the way about her as a philosopher, I mean about the character of her style of philosophy. Now I used the expression a moment ago, philosophy of cognition, rather than epistemology, given that the latter is usually associated with a general study of the status of perceptual and doxastic items with regard to conditions of veridicality and justification. Of course, like any philosopher, Anscombe was concerned with whether certain beliefs are true and whether they are justified, and with the more specific issue of what the objects of perception may be and the kind of knowledge that perception may deliver. But it's important to be clear at the outset that as an heir to and an ongoing participant in the Wittgensteinian revolution, a revolution against Cartesianism in metaphysics and philosophical psychology, she was not concerned with any general task of defining or justifying knowledge, be it perceptual or conceptual. Though, as we'll see, she did have views about the range and extent of perceptual and conceptual cognition. One reason for the issue of definition 
is that what is called knowledge may be quite different. I mean, this is something that she recognised, right? Not just as between knowing how and knowing that and knowing of, but even within uses of these expressions. Famously, for example, the issue in intention of knowledge without observation, observation requires us to distinguish between what would normally be involved in me knowing that I moved my hand when that was intentional on my part, and me knowing that you moved my hand, to which we can add, as another kind of knowledge, me knowing that you moved your hand, or indeed moved my hand intentionally. Now here there is a difference between non-observational and observational knowledge, but also between first-person and second-person knowledge of intentional action, as distinguished, say, from knowledge of another's heartbeat inferred from taking their pulse. So non-inferential knowledge of intentional action isn't the same as non-observational knowledge of such action, though the latter is an instance of it. We might also note differences that seem to cut across the knowing how, knowing that, and knowing of distinction, as in knowing when one is, and, which I think is something different again, knowing where one is. The latter issue, knowing where one is, is touched on by Anscombe in an examination published posthumously on grounds of belief. I think it's in the fourth volume. I don't know whether she discussed the former, knowing when one is, though she does have investigations of temporal relations and <coughs> the reality of the past and of knowledge of it by memory and by testimony. And the last source, testimony, which is relevant to what she says about cases of knowing where one is, may also be applied to instances of knowing when one is, where the knowledge in, this, in each case is not that expressed, if any knowledge is expressed, exclusively by token reflexives such as here and now, or not there and not then. So consider the first of what will be three or four ex uh, imagined exchanges between A and B. Imaginatively, these characters are titled A and B. So A says, do you know where you are? To which B replies, yes. To which A says, so where are you then? To which B replies, here. To which A says, do you know where here is? To which B replies, no. Do you know where you are? Yes. Where are you then? Here. Do you know where here is? No. There is a difference between knowing what time it is and knowing what century it is or what era it is, or if it is an era. And again, between knowing that one is standing in a building and knowing that one is standing in Bloomsbury or in Europe. It's not just that there's a difference in expectation with regard to someone's knowledge of when and where they are. It is that there are differences in what explain these differences. Not knowing the time is common enough. Not knowing the century where well, this is not because one has oddly forgotten or is mentally confused or lives in a culture where that measure doesn't occur, should strike us as odd. Again, consider another exchange. A says, what century is it? B replies, I don't know. A says, have you forgotten? B replies, no, I've never known. There is something odd. I hope you will think about that. Now, one might direct someone ignorant of it uh, sorry, you might, one might direct someone who's ignorant of when it is to look at the clock. But what would one refer them to as evidence of what century it is? There are, of course, documents and perhaps evidence, or uh, sorry, perhaps devices that report this, somewhat in the way in which a, a clock reports the time. But it's not ordinarily by reference to consulting these that one knows the present century as it is by looking at watches and clocks and mobile phones that one knows the time, the day, and the date. Also, while someone might be proud of their ability, as some people are, to tell what time it is, roughly, just by looking at the sky, no one could boast of a com comparable skill for telling the day of the week, or the date, or the century. You know, somebody who says, look, I'm pretty good at telling the time from the sky. Imagine saying to them, oh, tell me, how good are you at telling what day of the week it is by looking at the sky or the date or the century? 
Now, no doubt, our date, century, and era are conventional metrics. But there are also significant differences between them. Era is related to time, but also to the presence of a physical, in a broad sense, or cultural characteristic enduring through a temporal period. And this seems different from century, which again seems different from hour. Of these, century looks to be more detached from a non-temporal feature than does era. But some uses relax the temporal boundaries to encompass characteristics, as when historians speak of the long 19th century, which ran from 1789 to 1914, or a century of progress. And while in determining temporal location one might look for evidence in each case, our century era, it does not look like experiences involved in the usual understanding of this, which does apply in the case of knowing that one is in a building. I can see that in a way that even with a watch, I don't see the time. So whatever we mean by seeing the time, you don't see the time in the way in which you see that you're in a building. On the other hand, knowing that I'm in London does not seem just to be a matter of observation, even less knowing that I'm in Europe. Certainly if I currently know that I'm in Gordon Square, then given collateral knowledge that I have, I know that I'm in Bloomsbury, and thereby I currently know that I'm in London. But any of these could change without me changing location and without immediately observable consequences. For example, Bloomsbury might be redesignated Manorfield, as I believe it may once have been. Of course, I might infer these facts from observation of other things, but where they're not inferred, nor would I say they're observed. Rather, they're matters of common framework knowledge relying on testimony, usually communicated implicitly. I mean, it's an interesting question if you ask yourself the question, how did I learn that I live in Europe? You know, it wasn't by observation, I think. Now, um, thinking back to the earlier issue, if Anscombe is right, I know, I know non-observationally, through exercising my agency, that I have a body. That was one of the sort of themes, really. But my knowledge that I'm a human being does not, I think, Patchy Michael Thompson, who's written about this, seems to be non-observational in that sense. But nor does it seem to be observational either. Consider a third exchange. A. How do you know that you're human? B. One day I looked and saw that I was. A. What was it that you saw? B. Well, maybe it wasn't something I saw. I think it's just a feeling I had. So here's a question. How do you know that you're a human being? This is not meant to be a provocation to skepticism. It's a question about the kind of knowledge that we're dealing with here. Now, I embarked on this short reflection, having said that one reason Anscombe was not interested in traditional epistemology is that she did not subscribe to the idea <coughs> that there might be an essence or definition of knowledge in general. And the examples I've given illustrate the diversity of things called knowledge, which are different not just in the way of instances of the same phenomenon, but are themselves different sorts of thing. Practical competence, propositional knowledge, and acquaintance, where knowing, where, a, a, sorry, where knowing A is not equivalent to knowing that A is F or G or whatever, are not just defined over different classes of objects, or by reference to different kinds of warrant. Additionally, I think there's an issue in seeing how even propositional knowledge could be defined in terms of true, true belief plus warrant or cause. Since belief is a term <coughs> excuse me, indicating a quasi-disposition, while knowledge indicates an ability or capacity. I say quasi-disposition because as Anscombe points out, while belief is a grammatically dispositional concept, it's not a real disposition. Her understanding of the latter, the idea of a real disposition, is related to her metaphysics, to which I, I will return. But here she writes, and this is a quotation, what I call a real disposition is a property D such that to say that an object has D is to say that 
it is such as to do such and such under such and such conditions. The only saving clause we have to put in here is saving external interference. By this criterion, this is her continuing, neither knowledge nor belief signify real dispositions. Now, certainly someone who believes something or someone, uh, sorry, certainly someone who believes something or believes someone need not tend to a specifiable end as in the manner of a disposition. One may believe that P with ever, without ever saying it or anything you take to be implied by it or even thinking it, as Anscombe puts it, without the thought that P ever coming into one's consciousness. At the same time, however, the criteria, by which I mean something logically different from evidence, for ascribing belief is connected to sincerely thinking or saying. If we use the more general notion of doing something, which will cover thinking and saying and exercising non-cognitive capacities, then the same is true of ascriptions of knowledge. But that does not show that knowledge is the same kind of thing as belief. For as I said, someone who has knowledge has a recognition or capacity for identification or an effective power to do or to make something. As one might say, an ability to achieve or attain something fact of active or practive. Belief may have truth as its goal, but that does not show that someone who has a belief that P tends to the truth of P, evidently. Or that if P is true and he believes it, that this is an achievement or an attainment. Now, as well as not being interested in the definition of knowledge on account of holding a view akin to the Aristotelian dictum that existence is said to be in many ways, we could substitute for that, knowledge is said to be in many ways, in other words, it's an analogical concept, she's not interested in the question of the foundations of knowledge because there aren't any. Certainly not in the sense that other philosophers have tried to build knowledge out of sense experience or on the basis of principles of reason or innate ideas. <clears throat> As she puts it in one place writing about experience, we simply start in the midst of things. There are, as it were, no starting places, just the places we find ourselves. Now what I've said so far is oddly in a way still introductory. It's intended to indicate the diversity of things as Anscombe sees them, but also the way in which she goes about investigating them. And my earlier remarks about knowledge were, as it were, extensions of that on my own behalf, but as it were, applying Anscombian um, style. And one would hope insight. But also the way in which she goes about investigating them, which is by differentiating uses and cases and resisting the temptation then to assimilate them at some higher level of abstraction. There has been some discussion recently of Anscombe's philosophical method. I'm thinking of two uh, pieces of writing, one by Cora Diamond on reading the Tractatus with Anscombe. <coughs> um, the third part of that is titled Anscombe and Philosophical Method, and a piece by uh, two authors which will be appearing in the sixth volume, Global and Neustwandt, on Anscombe's Philosophical Method. That's his title. But I think that whether or not she has one, a philosophical method, or more than one, there's another feature that's worth pointing to, which is what I will call her demeanor. So I'm now interested in Anscombe's philosophical demeanor. According to Diamond, to Cora Diamond, in Anscombe's examination of the Tractatus, I quote, she lays out, makes open to view, a way of using words. She's attempting to put before the reader with the extreme intelligibility with which the, the account can, she thinks, be presented, what it is to say that something is so, uh, in the case of the Tractatus, on analogy with using a picture to say that this is so, a picture capable of being used also to say this isn't so. She herself is presenting a use of language, the picture proposition use, <clears throat> which will not make it look like a queer sort of fact that every proposition is either true or false. According to Lobel and Neuswandt, my contrast, or perhaps not by contrast, meanwhile, a commonly found method when writing on her own account uh, follows a four-stage path. So they, they identify these four stages. <coughs> Excuse me. First of all, asking what is X 
or what does X mean? And with that, setting out some answer or answers which purport to be non-circular. So this is not a quotation. This is me just sort of summarizing, glossing this. So the first stage in this process is asking what is X or what does X mean? And with that, setting out some answer or answers which purport to be non-circular. Second stage, according to them, is this. Showing that there can be no straightforward answer in the form of a translation or analysis or definition answering that question, what is X or what does X mean? but offering something nonetheless explanatory or explicatory. Third, identifying practices, typically linguistic ones, in which X features critically. And then fourth, showing how the foregoing description makes sense of X by showing its role uh, in relation to it. That, uh, that, that description reveals the role of these practices in relation to the term. Now certainly, <clears throat> Sorry, I spent 10 hours in an aeroplane getting here. That's a little dry of throat. Certainly, there is something recognisable in both of these accounts. Though I think what's recognisable is not um, distinctive uh, exclusively of, of Anscombe. In fact, um, one reason there may be something recognisable is because of their familiarity as philosophical methods more generally. One might think, for example especially with regard to what Lobel and Neuswant write, that the first and second stages are basically Socratic. And the first certainly so in the sense in which analytical philosophy in its heyday saw itself as engaged in Socratic definition, or the pursuit of Socratic definition. And the second then contra-analytic in the manner of Quine in Two Dogmas of Empiricism. So you could really see this first stage asking what is X, what does X mean, with that setting out some answer or answers which purport to be non-circular. And then the second stage showing there can be no straightforward answer in the form of a translation or analysis or definition, answering the question, what is X or what does X mean? Um, <clears throat> these correspond very broadly, as it were, I think, to a certain analytic conception of the task of philosophy, then, as it were, countered by the counter-analytic tendencies of, of Quine with regard to meaning. Um, <coughs> Meanwhile, the third and fourth steps are recognisably <coughs> late to Wittgensteinian. <coughs> Given Anscombe's education and later formation, this is hardly surprising. But I want to introduce two further features, the first of which may serve to explain what is surely obvious about her writing, namely its great difficulty. Rush Rees, who, together with Anscombe and von Richt, served as Wittgenstein's first literary executors, Rees gave a now oft-quoted report of the master's advice. I quote, Wittgenstein used to say to me, go the bloody hard way, adding, this is Rees adding this, I remember this more often perhaps than any other single remark of his. Rees, very close to Wittgenstein, says he remembers more than any other single remark, go the bloody hard way. Now, of course, going the bloody hard way oneself is compatible with clearing and preparing the way so that it's signposted and made even, becoming an easier route for those who follow. But Witt Wittgenstein and Anscombe don't do that. Sometimes it's only when we've been led to a dead end and a new start has begun that we realize we were being led along, led along the wrong track. This is not true of the essay Modern Moral Philosophy, but I th that, I think, is indicative of its atypicality. I think Modern Moral Philosophy stands out as being unusual in the corpus of Anscombe's writings. And I think the explanation for that is that she was setting out views born of what had been recent mass reading of moral philosophy for the purposes of tutoring it. She had taken on that role in order to allow Philippa Foote <clears throat> to take up an opportunity to spend a, a term in um, the United States. And so Anscombe had to prepare herself to teach, to tutor moral philosophy. And she thought, what's the best way of doing that? Well, let's just go off and read it. And so she read it, and uh, she gave a talk based on it. And that talk is modern moral philosophy. But I think modern moral philosophy is a quite distinct, it's, a, it's an unusual feature of this, because I think it's been such a focus of attention. And yet I think it's an atypical piece of Anscombe 
a philosophical work. Um, what I think, as I say, she was doing there was setting out views, uh, and those views represented her assessment of where the subject had gone wrong and what cultural shift might lie behind that. And that, again, is an uncharacteristic aspect of Anscombe's writing, is to speculate about cultural background and precondition of certain views. <clears throat> now, certainly, misdirection, returning to the, what I'm saying is the more characteristic way, going the bloody hard way and making us go the bloody hard way with them, certainly misdirection is also a Socratic or Platonic method. And she not only read dialogues of Plato, Anselm, Berkeley, and Hume, with appreciation, she also wrote some. Intention itself is hard to read because it's neither linear, nor paved, nor punctuated with clear views back or forward. We remain in rough and often obscure terrain. Now, one explanation of this might be the desire to show the workings, as it were. Another is that this is just a reflection of her own mode of thought. Both could be true, but I think there's also something else, in that, like Wittgenstein, she wants the reader to know the way is hard, or at least not to conceal the fact from them, which is to say for us to go that bloody hard way too. This is why I think, as in Wittgenstein, there's an element of many-voicedness in intention. Anscombe was not unwitting in matters of style. She can be very creative in formulating examples or introducing imagery. Also, I've seen a typescript of an earlier version of material for intention with accompanying comments by Philippa Foote, where Anscombe's text is more linear, plain, and easily followed, perhaps because she had still to recognize difficulties, or perhaps because having smoothed things out, she then, that she then thought it better to reintroduce or re-expose the bumps and the blocks and the fissures. In further characterization of her demeanor, and in contrast to the preceding, I want to mention something else that I've not seen discussed, though something related to it has been noted with regard to Wittgenstein, which is a similarity of vision, both in the way of seeing things and in the what of it that is seen, uh, to G.K. Chesterton. As with Oral Colney, Anscombe's conversion to Catholicism was influenced in part by reading Chesterton. And Wittgenstein was also an admirer of Chesterton's writings. For reasons of time, I'll not quote parallel passages uh, now, here and now, but I will pick out one idea, which is the idea in Wittgenstein that nothing is hidden, or if, in view of what I'm about to quote, what I should really say is that nothing is really hidden. That the facts lie before our eyes, but that either because they're so familiar or because we're in the grip of an idea or a spirit that distorts our sight, we don't see them. Now, this is a very Chestertonian theme. Um, and what we find uh, in Philosophical Investigations 129 is the following. The aspects of things that are most important for us are hidden because of their simplicity and familiarity. One is unable to notice something because it's always before one's eyes. The real foundation of, of um, the inquiry do not strike a man at all, unless that fact has at some time struck him, the fact that he's not struck by the foundations of his inquiry. And this means we fail to be struck by what, once seen, is most striking and most powerful. Now, these words could have come directly out of um, uh, Chesterton's work, Orthodoxy, um, and indeed some other uh, essays. So to understand uh, Anscombe's views on mind and world, to get to that, I think we could begin uh, by imagining pages in a children's book in the style, say, of a ladybird volume. Here parts of the world, or a world, are shown. Children playing, birds in trees, a cat on the mat, food on the table, and so on. And there are texts, as it were, below these, describing these things. And these books, these pictures, these texts, are used to teach children things. 
Reflecting on how that is possible and what is taught is a key to understanding Anscombe's view of the world and the manner, if not the mechanism, of our knowing. <coughs> so, for reasons of efficiency, let me now just sort of sketch uh, one or two aspects of, of Anscombe's view about of the nature of mind uh, and uh, of world. And I'll bring it back to those, that picture book, as it were. Um, <clears throat> so far as the world is concerned, uh, Anscombe's metaphysics is largely Aristotelian. In fact, she, um, we see a, a sort of very, clear, very clear glimpse of that in her essay on Aristotle in the volume Three Philosophers. Um, the, second, the three philosophers in question are Aristotle, Aquinas, and Frege. The second and third chapters were written by uh, Peter Geach, but the first chapter is written by, um, by Anscombe. And if you look at uh, writings of approximately the same time, such as her paper on substance, you can see that what she attributes to Aristotle in the Essay on Aristotle is very much the view that she advocates in the Essay on Substance. Now, um, as I say, her views uh, about um, the nature of the world are broadly Aristotelian, and I'll come back and say a little bit more uh, about that in a moment. <coughs> her views about the nature of thought, however, uh, are less clear. Um, I don't think Anscombe has a theory of thought. I don't think she has an account of, as it were, the mechanism, if one wants to put it that way. Of course, using the term mechanism already seems inappropriate in this way, but I don't think that she has a theory of thought. Um, I think that she thinks that human beings have a capacity or a set of capacities, uh, intellectual and, and sense capacities and so on, that enable us to acquire knowledge of the world, but... Those, the exercise of those capacities is already conditioned in a certain way by certain kinds of uh, frameworks. And this is where, in a sense, I want to come back to the, the ladybird uh, picture book, as it were, and think about the question, how is, how is it that children learn from looking at these pictures and what is it that they learn? Uh, well, one thing that they learn is a metaphysics. Uh, in particular, they learn a metaphysics of substance and attribute. And they also uh, learn a distinction, which is not so commonly expressed in contemporary philosophy, between two kinds of accidents, accidental accidents and propria, or proper accidents. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the ways in which um, this is put in as well, historical Aristotelianism is in terms of the theory of the categories. And Aristotle, very broadly uh, speaking, draws a distinction between um, predications uh, and accidents in the sense of contingent characteristics or features. Among the uh, non-contingent characteristics or features, the most obvious ones are predications of substance, predicates that tell you what a thing is. Um, so obviously something like, is a horse. It doesn't tell you how something is, it tells you what it is. Though other predications tell you how it is. It's a grey horse, it's a running horse, and so on. And the Aristotelians do this in terms of uh, the terminology of vesture, posture, location, and so on, and such like. But what I think is important to see in this is that um, there are certain kinds of predications which are non-substantial, but which are substance-involving predications. So if I tell you, for example, that something is walking, I haven't told you its essence, but I have told you something about the kind of thing that it is, in a way that I haven't told you something or told you much about it, if I say, for example, that it's moving quickly. Right? There could be lots of sorts of things that are moving quickly, but if I tell you that something is walking, I've introduced you to a living substance. And... Um, <clears throat> Within Aristotelian ways of formulating this, there are certain distinctions that are drawn and so on. But I think the most important distinction for our purposes, or the most important distinction is placed within the threefold distinction between substantial predications, proper accidents, and accidental accidents, purely contingent features. And um, regarding substances, we know little. I mean, Locke, in one sense, was right that regarding substance, we, uh, in one sense, it's, it's a kind of mysterious uh, category. 
But actually, a good deal about the nature of substance is revealed to us not by attempts to define the substances in question, defining man or whatever it is, but by the proper accidents. The things, if I say that, for example, he is speaking, uh, then I've told you something about this, the kind of substance this is. It's not definitional of man that man speaks, otherwise it would be impossible that there should be a man who didn't speak. But nor is it a contingent feature of men that they speak. So this is a category that contemporary philosophy generally doesn't recognise, which is non-necessary, non-contingent predications. It's not necessary that a man should speak. I mean, it could be something that was both a man and didn't speak, but it's not accidental either that men, for the most part, ut in pluribus, as the scholastics say, uh, speak. It belongs, as it were, to the nature of man, not to the essence of man, but to the nature of man. Now, Anscombe was alert to these points, both, as it were, from her reading of Aristotle, but on her own account. But how they're expressed in, in Anscombe is through phraseology that comes from Wittgenstein, though in a way it's Aristotelian, which makes one wonder where Wittgenstein got it from. And this comes out in the uh, expression, essence is expressed by grammar. So, um, <clears throat> Wittgenstein thinks, and Anscombe follows him in thinking this, though as I say, I think she deepens this with an Aristotelianism, thinks that um, we learn a great deal about the world from the grammatical structure uh, that is introduced to us in learning a language. So when we think about learning a language, there is a tendency, natural tendency, to think of a language as, as a set of names or name-like terms which are then concatenated into sentences. But when you learn a language, the thing that you learn, of course you learn a vocabulary, but you learn grammar. And in learning grammar, at least at a certain level of this, you learn a metaphysics. You learn something about the way the world is articulated in terms of substances, proper accidents, and accidents. And this comes out in different kinds of um, meaninglessness. Um, when you, as it were, slip outside a category. So one kind of meaninglessness would be, for example, in the um, utterance that um, the green triangle laughed loudly. One might say, look, triangles don't laugh. But that's not as deeply puzzling as the claim, the square root laughed loudly. Because after all, with the, the green triangle laughed loud, you can sort of do something with that. You can imagine a children's story in which you know, the green triangle is animated and turned into a, a kind of a substance in that sort of sense. There's nothing you can do with the square root. And the reason for that is that, metaphysically speaking, it belongs in a different category. Now, these things, we, uh, these are part of our metaphysical conception of the world, and they're given to us through things like ladybird books, and um, very basic uh, learning of English. So one of the tasks that Anscombe, I think, is engaged in is exhibiting the way in which essence and accident and propria are expressed in grammar. And part of the investigations in intention and elsewhere are really in investigations of the grammar of our language. And Anscombe says in various places that she thinks that this notion of grammar, as Wittgenstein uses, it should be taken quite literally but it's not an analogy or a metaphor. She really does think that this is in language as part of its structure. Now, the very interesting thing that she does, but not, I think, explicitly, and this would be part of a study that made this explicit, is connect uh, Wittgenstein's remarks about essence being shown in grammar with Aristotle's theory of the categories, because it is essentially uh, the, same, the same point put in different ways. So you might say that Aristotelianism, as a view of the structure of the world, is given to us through the structure of language. The metaphysics is in the language. Now, in that sense, there's, a, there's an element here of a priorism, that when we describe things, we bring to the descriptions the metaphysical structure uh, through the grammar. What goes into subject place, what goes into predicate place, what goes into the category of non-contingent but non-necessary predications and so on, reveals, as it were, the metaphysical structure of the world as we have it through language. Now here there's a deep question, which is whether or not language, or the grammar of our language, could be otherwise. That's to say, could there be another grammar? And that question 
Anscombe engaged with a couple of times. She engages it with it um, in asking the question, was Wittgenstein a linguistic idealist? And she engages, I mean, there's a couple of versions of that material. Uh, was Wittgenstein a conventionalist? And so on. And she engages with it twice over in two reviews of the same book, which is a very interesting thing to do. Generally, uh, editors frown upon people producing two reviews, whether in the same journal or different journals. The book that she reviewed twice, and I'm sure this is the only example, is Kripke's uh, book on um, uh, rule following. And so what's, what's the Kripke title? Pri uh, no, no, the, the language. Uh, the private language argument, yeah. Um, in which she thinks that this, uh, Kripke's puzzle, as it were, she thinks it's not Wittgenstein's, but nonetheless she thinks that what it poses again is this question of, of um, linguistic idealism, that as it were, okay, a metaphysics is given through the structure of our language, but couldn't we have another language, right, which would give us a different kind of metaphysics? Now, I think that's a very uh, deep question. If we were a sort of, say, a Strawsonian philosopher, we might rest content with having exhibited the logical structure of our own language, the sort of thing that the Strawson does in individuals and, and in other writings, perhaps most famously in the chapter of individuals on persons. <clears throat> or we might try to fashion a transcendental argument to try to show that the conditions of the possibility of any linguistic structure are going to have... Um, uh, a certain form, and in that sense, there, there could only be one metaphysics. I mean, that's not to say there could only be one philosophy of nature, but in the deep sense, there could only be one kind of metaphysics. Now, there is another way in which you might try to sort of secure um, a given metaphysics, or I now can put it this way, a given grammar, and that would be by arguing that the world itself imposes that grammatical, that structure on our grammar. And um, that idea is in one respect entertained uh, by her husband. In a very famous essay, well, famous among those people who read these sorts of essays, I suppose, uh, called Form and Existence, in which he revisits the Aristotelian Thomistic doctrine that the structure of thought has as its components um, the same elements as make up the world. That substantial forms and accidental forms Propria, which he doesn't discuss in this context, but those, those structural elements of the world recur in us in the form of thought. So if you like, corresponding to substantial forms are concepts, but the concept horse and the form of horse, as it were, the Aristotelian form of horse, are the same thing, the same reality, um, exemplified in different modes of, of being or different modes of actuality. Interestingly, Anscombe was sceptical about this view. Um, there is a paper of hers, again posthumously published, called Thought and Existent Objects, uh, Thought About Existent Objects, in which she begins by voicing a scepticism and then sort of suspends it. Whereas, <laughs> whether this was a courtesy to her husband, I'm not quite sure. But at any rate, um, but there is something in there to be about which more uh, needs to be said. Um, the materials that one would gather for the purpose of, of trying to sort of elaborate what a, a view of thought, given the view of grammar and essence that I've mentioned, um, the materials one would gather, would, there are very few of them, uh, three or four pieces. One, a review in uh, the Times Literary Supplement of the first few volumes of the translations of Summa Theologiae that came out in the 60s. Uh, one, Events in the Mind. But there are very few uh, materials. And, as I say, some of this posthumously published material. I think Anscombe, just as she sort of eschewed epistemology in a certain sense of it, I think she also eschewed the theory of thought in a certain understanding of it. Uh, quite why is it, it would it itself be an interesting question. Just finally, on her views about mind itself, as I said, that she thought that mind um, is a set of intellectual capacities, or if we speak more broadly of psyche, then that'll involve sensory and imaginative capacities as well, and so on. But she, again, um, distances herself from a certain aspect of a tradition that she is otherwise appreciative of, namely the Aristotelian uh, Thomistic tradition. Some of you will know that later in the, um, the De Anima, Aristotle uh, introduces the question as to whether or not uh, th well, this is our way of putting it, whether or, th or not thought is an organic uh, activity or process. 
And he gives reasons uh, for thinking that, that it's not to do with, the, I mean, reasons to think that thought is immaterial, <clears throat> which is then carried forward by some Aristotelians to say, well, an immaterial power must reside in an immaterial subject. And this raises the famous question of the separability of the intellect, a kind of dualism. But Anscombe, interestingly, where, uh, uh, well, in a symposium, actually, uh, which I, I happen to be writing in another context, a longish piece on the reception of Aquinas into analytic philosophy, <coughs> and discovered, um, I knew of these pieces of material before, but I didn't know their history, that she and Herbert McCabe, whom we were <coughs> mentioning earlier on, um, presented two papers to a symposium. The symposium was on the immortality of the soul. These two pieces were eventually published, though they don't, there's no uh, identification of the fact that they were given as papers in the same symposium, <coughs> in which Anscombe um, distances herself from this, these, uh, this uh, Aristotelian argument. She thinks that thinking is not a material activity, but she doesn't think that it's an activity of, or that we can move from this to the idea that it's an, uh, an activity of an immaterial agent. And later, about the last thing that she may have said um, in, uh, in her lifetime, I'm setting aside posthumous uh, publications and so on, <coughs> is an, int uh, an interview. Do you know that one with Roy Varghese? Do you know those interviews? Luke? Oh, yeah. Maybe not, yeah. Um, but where he presses her on the question of uh, the soul, as it were, and she, um, she, she's clearly discomforted by this. Um, and uh, she says something like, well, you know, Aquinas, and he says something, but doesn't Aquinas argue for the separability of the intellect and so on? <coughs> and she says, well, he does, but this is a very difficult issue, and you can see she just rather the question wasn't asked. I think in this respect, this is a place where she, she can't follow uh, in the Aristotelian to mystic pathway and so on. But to write, uh, well, I will be writing about these, or you will have a written version of these in due course, but... Um, uh, I think that the, the sort of key into this, as I say, apart from thinking about the, the manner of her doing philosophy, is <clears throat> the interplay between the appropriation of the Wittgensteinian idea of grammar and the Aristotelian idea of the categories as articulating the structure of the world, but the idea that, um, in some sense, this structure is given to us a priori uh, through the form of the acquisition of language. And just to return to that picture book, as I said, the point about children who learn that picture book is they don't just learn that um, you know, a ball is green or yellow or whatever it is. They learn that it's circular. <laughs> and they learn that it's a solid object, right? though they're looking at flat pictures. They actually acquire an understanding of the substantial structure of the world. Anyway, on that note, I shall close. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.